For those of us in the firearms community, we are always trying to introduce new people to the sport we enjoy. In this episode, we talk to world champion shooter Josh Freilich about how being approachable, checking your ego at the door, and putting fun back into the time on the range is how we continue to grow. This is the No Excuse to Miss podcast. Welcome to the No Excuse to Miss podcast. I'm your host, Scott Volkwartzen, and this week's guest is a world champion competition shooter, Josh Freilich. Welcome to the show, Josh. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, all good. Uh, I like talking with people that are in the gun industry that are uh, doers, right? Like uh, you, you've done plenty. Uh, you work hard in this space, and uh, I, I'm a fellow entrepreneur, and so I, I enjoy talking to business people that uh, are successful in this space. So excited to be here. Well, I'm looking forward to it, just given your background in that entrepreneur space and different things, and then trying to tie it all back into, you know, shooting, the marketing behind shooting, competition shooting, and the industry as a whole. Yeah. So before we get into that, though, I learned something when I was doing a little research. I didn't realize you fought MMA to put yourself through college. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like a way better job than delivering pizzas, <laughs> you know, or my buddies were working at the bar and it, I went to college a little later after I caused a bunch of trouble when I was a young kid. And so I was like, I don't want to drink. I don't want to be in the bar scene. Like, where can I be like pretty physically and mentally healthy, but also make a few bucks during college? And I was like, well, I mean, these dudes are getting paid to fight. This is kind of cool. So yeah, that's what I chased after during school. So how long did you do that? Yeah, I did that for, call it about three and a half years. Um, you know, the first maybe year, year and a half was mostly just training and like exhibition bouts and lots of sparring with people that were doing it for real and trying to figure out like what my skill level actually was versus what my ego wanted to tell me it was, and, you know, <laughs> and then, uh, got to a point where I was like, okay, okay. I know kind of what I'm doing now. And so as long as I was evenly matched, I'm like, let's go. And, uh, you know, so then I fought. Um, call it pro, but I mean, pro is just when you get paid and, uh, I wouldn't call the dollar amounts. I got paid pro, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, you make 500 bucks to fight on a Saturday night or something. And it's like, Oh, well, you know, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Like you said, a little more exciting, more, a little more adventurous than a lot of ways that we put ourselves through school. Yeah. When did you know that it was time to probably transition from that into something else? Yeah, so I finished school and I'm a sales and marketing guy. And so I got into the tech space as a sales guy. And, you know, I'm in a, a suit jacket, you know, and slacks and like knocking on doors, at business to business sales, selling tech, right? Like trying to get meetings with the decision makers at these companies in my territory. And it's like, if you've got a black eye, like good luck, like either they're going to be <laughs> really excited to talk to you, like, like, you know, about fighting or they want nothing to do with you. And so like, you know, I had a young family and I'm going, you know, like, this is a real job. Like there's career potential. I can make a bunch of coin, build myself something for the future. And the two things just didn't align. And so it was like, okay, well, it's time to take all the hustle and grind that I focused on the fight space and move it over to the business space. And that is where I guess I would say I invested really all of it, all of my energy for maybe like four years, even before I found the shooting space. That was just, I moved my addiction in that direction, you could say, and and just went after it. Well, I know on your website, it says nothing beats hard work, hustle, dedication, integrity, practice, grind, and discipline, nothing. Facts. So, and you yeah. just touched on it, your hustle and grind. <laughs> yeah. Where did, did that come to you like through college or were you like this as a young kid or where did that mindset come from? Yeah. I mean, I'm an, I'm an addict, so I'm a recovering addict. I've got 16 years clean. I was a junkie and, uh, you know, so like my mind works one way. I'm either all in on something or I'm just not. And so like what I learned in recovery early on was that most of the recovery principles that a lot of folks follow didn't work for me. They were talking about controlling this, you know, monster inside you. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like I can't do that. I can point it. 
I can point it where I want. And if I point it somewhere healthy, guess what? I'm going to go that direction and I'm going to grind. I'm going to go after it. And then, you know, as I matured a little bit, I started adding things like integrity into that concept, right? Because junkies don't live by integrity, but you gotta, no. you, you gotta add that in, right? Because it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to grind, I'm going to hustle, but it's like, I'm not going to burn people while I do it. And, you know, so walking through that, it's like, I, I don't really have a choice. Like I'm going to grind, I'm going to work, I'm going to hustle at whatever I'm pointing this thing at. And so, um, you know, just trying to pick things and directions and, you know, a vision, if you will, on where I want to go with this thing and then just cut myself loose on it, you know? <laughs> and I think that's an interesting put way to put it because I, I'm very similar. I'm wired very similar to that, that I am all in. If I'm going to go do something, I can't just do it to enjoy it. I have to see how far I can take it, which can be very beneficial with certain things, very destructive in other areas, if you let it, like you said, if you don't point it in that right direction. Yep. Yep. So I have a constant evaluation process almost on a monthly basis where I'm like, all right, like, has this thing got off the tracks? Like, am I going in the direction that's still leading to where I want it to go? Um, and there have been adjustments, you know, on a constant basis where I'm going, well, maybe the goal changed now. Maybe like I'm trying to move towards something new. Maybe I'm trying to move toward a bunch of stuff at once. It's like, all right, how do I focus this thing? Cause uh, you know, like you gotta have a little bit of focus uh, and that's still something I work on on a regular basis. So it, it probably comes in very beneficial, like with your shooting career. Yeah. Because of the time, you know, the practice, everything that requires, how did you, or what made you decide to get into the competitive shooting world? Yeah. Well, so I uh, was living with my young family. My first, uh, I think my daughter was less than one. My wife and I had this little house in suburbia and one of the neighbors got burglarized. And so I didn't have any guns at the time. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go get a pistol and just to make sure I could protect the family. I couldn't shoot worth beans. And like, you know, so pride check, you know, like I'm pretty good at that going. All right. Like I'm, I'm not just going to let my pride like take over and run away from stuff I'm bad at. Uh, if it's somewhere I want to invest time and energy and being able and capable with a handgun was important to me. It was like, this is me. I'm a man. Like I want to protect my household if I need to, like I didn't feel capable of doing that beyond, you know, my hands. Uh, and I was like, okay, so I'm going to learn this thing. So I shot a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot, I, you know, I bought a uh, 22 long rifle conversion kit for my Glock one of those advantage arms, little 22 kits. Right. <laughs> and I bought, uh, back when 22 was like cheap and I've been doing this a little while. I bought 10 of those golden bullet buckets, 1400 rounds in those buckets. And so I had 14,000 rounds to learn how to shoot. And <laughs> I shot all of them in the summer. And so, uh, you know, I learned, uh, how to shoot, but like, um, and then I was super confident. I was like, yeah, I can crush with a gun. Like I'm great. I can hit anything that comes <laughs> in my door. If it's bad news, it's down. And, uh, went and shot machine guns, just rented them with my brother at this gun club. And the guy was like, Hey, listen, like if you're really into shooting, it's one thing to hit targets. It's another to be able to do it fast. And when there's pressure, and I was like, Oh, okay, well, what's that? And he goes, well, it's competition shooting and there's a match tomorrow. And that gun you got right there, you can just bring that ammo and uh pick up a couple mag pouches before you leave here today and you'll be you'll be totally set for that match and so went over and shot an idpa match just to see what it was all about and got my mind blown um because i could hit everything and i hit everything no problem that wasn't an issue um but there was a dude there and he's still a buddy of mine his name's andre de santelli he's a world-class pcc shooter great production shooter and he was shooting his Glock 17 at that match. I was too. So I'm like, ah, this dude's got the same gear I do. I bet, you know, this should, this should be a fight, right? <laughs> no, he crushed it. <laughs> like, like I'd never seen anybody run a gun that fast and hit the stuff. Like, you know, maybe make dumps into the tree or whatever as, you know, a kid. But yeah. like this dude hit all the things, shot real fast. And I was like, all right, all right, that's what I want to do. I want to do what he does. And, uh, you know, I've been on a journey ever since of like, getting more speed, more accuracy. And, you know, I mean, talk about the addiction part. Like I did like 55 matches that first summer. 
Um, you know, in Minnesota, there's matches three or four days a week around the Twin Cities area. And so I just shot guns and I just got, you know, better at it and I still do work on that on a regular well, basis. And, and you said something earlier that you're pretty good at, you know, checking your, I don't know if you want to call it ego or pride at the door and say, okay, where can I get better? Yeah. And how beneficial is that? Because I think a lot of times people will go to that first match, get their butt kicked and then they'll almost try to go find somewhere else that maybe they can compete instead of what you did. You're like, I just need to get better. Yeah. It almost intimidates them or scares them away or into a different discipline to somewhere they feel a little bit more comfortable. So how important has that mindset been like since, you know, even to this day when you're still competing, it's everything. If you can't go somewhere and get humbled and then learn from that experience, you cannot grow as a person, as a human being, like, because we are, while we want to, you know, confidence and self-confidence are critical. Like you got to have it, but there's a difference between being a confident human being and having pride control your life, right? Like those are different things. And, you know, you're, you maybe your, your stereotypical masculine male um, can certainly let pride control their life and just like run from anything that could humble you. Right. And, like you said, everywhere in life, but the, definitely in the shooting sports, I feel like there are a lot of alpha males. Yes. Absolutely. That, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure we've all struggled with that from time to time, but, but like you said, it, it applies to <laughs> just about everything we do in life. Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah. And so being able to learn from those experiences, shoot, I had it Sunday night. Like I have not shot a match in four months. I take the winter off to save my sanity. I didn't for six years and I started to burn out, was thinking about just hanging it up. And my wife's like, why don't you just take a break? I was like, I don't really do that. I either do it or I don't. She's like, <laughs> okay, so can you learn from that? And I'm like, ah, whatever. I, she was fine. Just quit right now. And then two months from now, if you feel like doing it again, do it again. And so I like had a silent retirement and didn't like say anything about like being done, done, but was like, went hunting, uh, enjoyed life, did, learned how to trap up here in our timber and uh, like just enjoyed a couple of months off. And I was so fired up to come back and do competition shooting the next year. I was like, well, I got to do that every year. So Sunday was my first match back after that break this year. Just embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> you know, the speed's all there, but uh, I'm not seeing at the pace I need to see in order to get the hits required just to compete well. And so same situation. I know that walking into that match, I'm about to get smoked by dudes that should not beat me. That's okay. Um, because you know what? I'm a confident person. I'm going to take and learn from each one of those stages. Like, why didn't I see what I needed to see on that? What could I work on this week to make sure that I'm disciplined on the sites so that I'm not shooting before the tar, you know, before I can get my hits and, you know, like it's a life skill. You, you got to be able to be comfortable getting humble. And, and I don't think people realize when they go to a match and they watch like the top level shooters, like you are, how much, how many reps and how much time on the range and practicing those boring drills? Well, a lot of people would consider the boring drills that yep. you guys do to get to that level. Yep. Yeah. I mean, one of the big comments I get when I train with people that like, so I do, I offer training, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when people come and they just shoot with me. Like I've got friends that'll come and just shoot with me. They're often like, all right, like, like when, when's, when's the next level stuff? Like, when do we do the, the stuff that takes me where I need to go? It's like, we've been doing it. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's speed fast drills. It's three target arrays. It's short, you know, drills that you're, you're refining the fundamentals. And that, you know, people are shocked by that. They're like, ah, uh, man, I figured there was something else off camera that all you guys were working on that I was just waiting to get a, you know, a picture of. It's like, no it's the fundamentals. Just do it better. As they see that final result on Instagram and that's where they want it. They think that's where the magic is. Yes, <laughs> for sure. So like you said, you train a lot of people and, and I'm sure you get a lot of questions about, you know, your career and getting involved in competition shooting. Mm -hmm. What's like some of the common misconceptions that people trying to get into the sport overlook or don't fully understand? 
Yeah, I mean, the easiest and least expensive way to get good is just to dry fire. I mean, like a lot of folks think they need to squirt bullets every time they train. And the short answer is that's great if you have the ability and access and all of those things and wallet that can support that. But it isn't necessary because a lot of what we do is fundamentals and it's it's actual manipulations. Like, do you know your firearm? I mean, I train um, even today, you know, like I get reps in, in the house, unloaded gun, unloaded magazines, no ammo around, targets up on walls, and I'm refining my draw, refining my reloads. Like I don't need to do those on the range. When I'm on the range, I shoot. Um, And so that allows me to stay focused while I'm out there. It allows me to do what I need to do in here. And it's free. Guess what? Like it costs nothing because I'm not shooting any ammo. Um, So it's an inexpensive way that a new shooter can, you know, bring the sights up on target. Like, are you bringing the gun up and presenting in the center of the target? Uh, Where's that sight picture coming up to when you draw from your holster? Is it where you want it to be? If not, like get reps in, right? All those little things that are free. Um, You know, that helps a lot. And I, I think sometimes right along those lines of being free, I think sometimes people have the misconception that, you know, like a guy in your situation, oh, it's easy for him because he's sponsored by federal. He's, yeah, <laughs> you know, he has all the, he has all the best gear, all the free ammo he can shoot, you know, whatever the arrangement is. Yeah. And we see that from like a sponsorship side is a lot of times people, they think you need to get, start getting the stuff given to them and the free stuff. And then they'll be able to progress up the ranks. Yeah. Where a lot of times, and I'll let, I, I'm interested in your take on this, especially with your sales and marketing background. Yeah of you know being i assume what you did building yourself up putting that the time practice work in and then once you've started to achieve some success then go out and try to recruit some sponsorship and work with different companies yeah absolutely i mean the fact is that a sponsor sponsee relationship is a partnership and both need to add value for it to be successful right and so if the new shooter that has no influence in the community, no skills, can't help people improve or guide them on their gear process or like they can't do any of those things yet. They've got no business really uh, looking for a handout because that's not what sponsorship is anyway. Right. And so uh, I didn't have sponsors for like the first 18 months, right? Like I had sponsors back when I was a fighter, like I'm a sales and marketing guy. I know all about brand affiliations and brand alignment. And like, But I chose not to do that because I didn't have a social following. Um, I wasn't someone that people asked questions on the range yet. Like I didn't have deep relationships in the community yet. Like I had no influence, right? And so for good reason, like I was still really um, learning all my trade and in, in order to really add value, like you have to be able to help people, like the, you're, you're solving people's problems. And I didn't have those solutions yet, you know? <laughs> and so like 18 months in, I was like, okay, I believe now, like uh, at every match I was getting questions from shooters. I was starting to put some content out online. It was terrible, but I was working hard. Um, and like, I was, I was at this point being asked those questions and I had solutions like from my own personal experience. And so, yeah, that's the point where it was like, well, let's say, what gear do I like? What gear did I buy already? All right. I'm going to go talk to those companies because I know the product. I know the gear. And I'm going to go, Hey, like, listen, like I already shoot your stuff. Like I'd like to partner with you and help other people realize the value of your brand and your products. And then, you know, start small and add value. And and that's the way that I progressed and got started in the game. But I was already pretty good. Like uh, I'd already developed some skills. It's not necessarily about being good, but like I was good enough to help others get better. And I understood my gear well enough so that I could consult others on if it's the right gear for them. And I was an open book. Like you want to talk to me about the gear, the sport, like life, like about all of this, like I'm in. And so at that point I felt like, okay, I'm adding value for the community. I can add value for a partner. And now it can be a true partnership versus free stuff. Cause there's no such thing as yeah. free stuff. No. Yeah. And I think you bring up a great point that, you know, when we hear the word influence, I think we constantly go to influencer and how many followers do they have on social media? Yeah. But there's a lot of ways to influence, 
you know, that can be more valuable to a company even than, you know, the huge social media following and that's being on the range, yep. you know, and even sometimes letting other people try your gear or being able to answer the questions of the products you're using, yeah. you know, more so than just what is recited off a website. Absolutely. I mean, you know, anytime I talk to a newer shooter, someone that's thinking about chasing after this as like a career, you know, like I have built a career in the firearms industry and it's been through these value partnerships and then I've grown it in other areas as well. But like, so I get a lot of questions on that level now from people that are like maybe five years in great shooters, great around the range. And they're going, Hey, like, how do I approach these companies now? And it's like, well, don't do what you think they want. Ask what they want, right? Like first and foremost, like what are they looking for? And then it's not always the right fit. Like, do you fit that model? Because like you might only have a thousand people that follow your Instagram and for you to go and start cranking out videos every day might not be within your core competency or your comfort level. You may hate it. Like don't, don't do things you hate, have fun with all of this. But like, if you love coaching, you're an instructor, you're on the range three days a week for locals, like there's value there, but like sell the value you already want to provide that you enjoy versus going, all right, here's what I think they want. I'm going to just tell them that's what I'll do. And then I'll be totally uncomfortable and hate life. Like that's bad. Don't do that. And it, yeah. And if you absolutely hate, like, let's say putting videos out, you may be able to do it for a short time thinking that you're going to get to that point where, and sometimes you find out it's not as bad as you think, but if you absolutely yeah. hate it, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're going to stop doing it. And the, yes, I mean, there's, there's a limit to how much you're going to keep putting yourself through in that case. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, life is, is short and we've got opportunities to do whatever we want while we're here. And so I choose to invest time in things I enjoy. And so like when I'm pre- proposing a list of things and commitments that I'm willing to do for partnerships and I'm going through things that I enjoy or some of them are small growth areas that like I'm not always 100% comfortable again like I'll get humbled in that side too and I'll learn from those things but like if they if they drive me nuts like I'm not going to be your uh I'm never going to be a gunsmith like I've learned that like I'm not handy. I don't enjoy tinkering. I like those aren't things. So like me going through and doing detailed product review on this little piece and that I don't do it because that's not me and I don't enjoy it. And I'm, I don't feel that's one of my skills, but like the overall product solution, does it solve a problem? Here's the problem it solves for me. Like I found that's a, that's a place I'm comfortable. And so, you know, all of those things, we, you kind of do a bunch of stuff and figure out what you like. Um, but the more closely aligned you are to the things you're interested in and actually enjoy, like you say, the more uh, long-term that type of a situation is going to be. In. And, and that would probably explain some, I feel like you've been with some of your sponsors or you've been ambassadors for them for considerable amount of time, which speaks to the value that you're providing them. Yeah. And you also just touched on something, providing value on how something's working or not working is also a, like from our standpoint, something that we appreciate all the time because our shooters are out there putting more rounds down range than we're typically going to usually in worse conditions, you know, it might be hot, dusty, rainy, whatever. And that gives us feedback to make our products better for the end consumer. So, you know, like you said, there's a lot of different ways to add value other than a huge social media following and getting a bunch of likes. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. I've got partners or buddies that uh, the only thing that they do for their partners uh, is they are a good steward on the range. They help out the shooters and they shoot a lot. And so they do R&D. And so I've helped coach them a little bit on, hey, build a spreadsheet, right? Document ammo numbers, document any challenges, uh, opportunities, share that with the product team, get to know product team, not just marketing team. Like that's what they're good at. They're going to shoot a lot. Like, so guaranteed they can just tell you their experience, right. As a, as one of the aligned partners that maybe the, their ask can't be as huge as if they worked every day on video and stuff like that for a brand, but they can still add value. And so I've got partners that that's or buddies that that's literally that the whole thing they do is just, I shoot 50,000 rounds through pistols each year. Would you like me to shoot 50,000 rounds through yours and give you really good feedback on it? 
and represent you on the local range? And the answer is yes, at a certain dollar amount, that makes sense for a brand, right? Um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So whatever it is, you know, whatever you enjoy, whatever you're already doing that would be valuable, those are great places to focus. Yeah. Uh, another question when it comes to the competition side, I'm a, I'm a big fan of like diet, nutrition, training mm -hmm. and how it applies. Once again, it's kind of like it, it applies to all areas of life. Yeah. You know, if you can be disciplined in one area, I feel like it'll transfer over to other areas. And I feel like it's getting better at like matches and different things, but how much value do you put on like when you travel to a match on your sleep, your hydration, your nutrition? Yeah, it's huge. You know, I, I see sometimes, you know, young kids are out there drinking Red Bulls and then, yeah. <laughs> you know, in my mind, I have no idea how they hit anything after that point. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I think the key is uh, training how you compete. And so what I will say is some of those dudes perform at a pretty high level because they do that every day. And so if your everyday meal is like pizza and Red Bull <laughs> and you just roll right on through and you train well on that. And that, I mean, like, I don't know how sustainable it is. I don't live by that, but like I see them able to do those things where for me, I got to eat pretty clean. Um, I've, I've got a, you know, high protein, uh, vegetable stuff like that for the most part during shooting season, um, some fruits for breakfast. I do drink an energy drink, but I'll do a little sip as I start to slow down through the day, I just pour it into my water bottle after the first water because the hydration's key. And then I'm just a sip maybe when I'm in the hole to just bring my focus right back a little tighter before I shoot. But, you know, like nutrition, sleep, I don't stay at the party house. I could, I don't want to. There's always a party house. I'm there to do a job, you know? So like those things are a big deal, real big deal. You know, it's like any other endeavor that we get into. Yeah, it's fun. And, then, you know, that's part of the whole thing is being around the guys or being around, you know, the shooters. But that does come at a price when, you know, it might be four. You're used to getting seven, eight hours of sleep and now you get three or four because you were up all night. And, <laughs> yeah. and then you go out and expect and you can't figure out why maybe you didn't perform at your best. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. I mean, that that is that is the deal. Like, certainly don't have a worse lifestyle when you're expecting better results than normal, right? Like it, that's the opposite of what you'd want to, you know, but I do, I have found that if I go too far uh, from my norm at a match, I also perform relatively poorly because my body's like, what are you doing? You know, like, so if I, if I, if I'm eating, you know, some carbs and some stuff like that rarely, and then I go to the match and I add a few carbohydrates, make sure that I've got plenty of, you know, glycogen in my muscles and I can explode out of position. It's like, yeah, but my body's not sure what to do with that because I haven't been eating that lately. And so I, I, I just try to stay pretty clean and even as I'm leading up to an event. And then I, I stay consistent while I'm there so that I perform pretty well. And that's a great point because then you kind of learn, like you said, with the energy drink, you know that if you kind of sip on it throughout the day, what it's going to do for your focus, for yep. your energy, and it's no big surprises when you get to the line that all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, maybe that was a bad idea or maybe that was, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's long range stage and three gun. You got 600 yard target and you're bouncing off the walls. That's a pretty big problem. Yeah. Well, we just did an event in South Carolina over the weekend where they were able to come out on Friday and just kind of a lot of it. A lot of the people that were shooting were new shooters. They had never shot in steel or never shot steel and others you know, we're more experienced or whatever, but it was interesting because they would come up later and they even commented, they're like, I was doing much better in the morning or in the afternoon. And then I had a couple energy drinks or an energy <laughs> drink. And all of a sudden it was a lot harder and I couldn't figure out how I lost everything I learned that morning. I'm like, well, yeah. Breathing control. I don't know. Yeah, it's maybe. a lot tougher. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, one other thing on the competition shooting that I want to jump into some other stuff is what, in your opinion, with your background, do you think our industry can do to bring it a little more mainstream and make it more accessible to like the average audience? And what I mean by that is, and I've said this before on podcasts, the one thing that I think we struggle with is we hand out participation trophies to everybody that shows up. Yeah. 
with all the different, and, and it's hard for the average, you know, guy, the average person that's into firearms to figure out who actually won the event or who the best shooters are. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a lot to that and uh, I'm on a journey to figure that out. And so I've been shooting with a lot of organizations. I think one of them that does it really, really well is not necessarily an organization, but an event. And so I went to Kalash Bash, which is an AK 47 festival, right? That has a match at it. So like Imagine going to like a music festival um, and then you could like also practice your instrument over here and compete. So it's like it's like that where there's a thousand, fifteen hundred 1500 people that show up and pay to be there. They camp. They, you know, they show up. They're part of this festival with 30 vendors and, you know, you know, vendor booze. Barely anybody's at them at a, you know, at a USPSA or three gun a match or because they're so focused. They want to win this thing, right? Like they're, they're just there to, to compete at the highest level where by making it this festival over here that brings in people that are gun community and then also having a match at it, they've just created a pretty unique culture where you'll have a hundred people watching your stage run where they're just like, wow, that's awesome. And then they're overshooting guns at the booths and stuff like that. And so I, I'm not exactly sure what it, what it is other than, like we focus really, really hard on, uh, yep. Like you say, everybody getting a participation trophy. Like if you ultimately like rewarded the winners at that event, everyone else there would be a little bit less stressed and be able to be gun community and just enjoy the culture because they know they're not going to take the top spot. And that's okay. I'm not even going to take the top spot at a lot of events that I shoot. And not that's okay. I'm going to shoot my best, but like, it'd be okay to bring that culture in where it's just a bunch of gun people and they're not so stressed about getting 47th or 40th. Like who cares? Like just enjoy the people, enjoy the culture. So I think that's one. And then the other piece is, you know, I run a media company and uh, in that media company, we are focused on doing a lot of competition shooting and t-shirts and jeans and stuff like that, that actually reach the rest of the community, the gun culture, because uh, we as competition shooters have a pretty bad rep uh, in that other world where guys are going, you guys are just serious. Like you're not any fun to shoot with. And so it's like, uh, I'm trying to find ways to blend their worlds, shooting at an extremely high level on camera, t-shirt jeans, cool stages, that brings the rest of the community and culture where people are going, what is that? And where can I go do that? And it's like, this is competition. They're like, oh, I heard that sucked and the people were dumb. It's like, no, like this is, this is just gun culture people. Like you don't need a fancy shirt to do it. You know, I still wear a Jersey at majors and stuff like that. But like uh, part of that media is just showing real people uh, shooting guns at a high level and that's attractive. And so by doing things like that with our media production, we're getting a lot of engagement from folks outside of our space to try to pull them in and go, hey, listen, there's a great community. Not everybody. There's always a bad apple. But like there's a great community of people and there's a place where you can refine your skills way more than you ever thought possible. And that's this competition shooting space. And you can do it however you want, like your style in it, T-shirt, like you want to wear kit. I don't care. Like wear armor, like do whatever you want. Like, but like just come play and get better at your craft and be around gun people. And so, you know, that's a focus area of ours. Like I'm really working hard to drive uh, probably about 60% or more of our media is t-shirt jeans uh, looking like just average Joe, but hammering pistols, hammering rifles, guys going, Whoa, what was that? And where do I get to go do it? Because that's how we can grow our space, I think. And I think that's awesome because to me, that's also more relatable to the average person. But, you know, there's something about, you know, and I, I don't want to sound hypocritical. Obviously, our sponsored shooters wear our jerseys at yeah, time. Yeah, for sure. But but at the same point, that also, you know, to a lot of shooters almost puts like them in a different category mm -hmm. that yep. they can't necessarily relate to. Yep. Yep. And even when they're on the range, for, so if I'm on the range, I'm all jerseyed up. 
it's it's awkward almost where like at a local because dudes are like oh that's josh he's pro like uh, i'm not another guy in the golden culture i'm this dude they saw on the internet and like, like that's actually a problem because it's a wall that is put up between me and the general shooting community and that's not a wall i want up like and so at the at the pro matches at stuff like that absolutely i want to represent my brands my partners and i'm doing that in my t-shirt anyway right like i'm still yeah. rocking a vortex or a federal shirt or whatever <laughs> you know what i mean but it's like so it is still that but it's not the full-blown race get up and that it makes me more approachable i get guys that are at their first or second match that are showing up with their full, like, you know, war belts and stuff like that. And, you know, they got a knife on the back of the thing. Like it's the only gun gear they have, <laughs> but I get to have conversations and interface with these dudes. Cause I'm rocking a t-shirt and jeans versus if I'm full kit, like in my Jersey and all that stuff, uh, they seem to be more hesitant to engage. And, and you mentioned something earlier too, that if you just have like your top few finishers, it takes a lot of the pressure off. Yeah. You know, for some of those, they can just go out back out and have fun. You know, if I finish 30th, fine. If I finish 60th, fine. Yep. And it's not so much, you know, can I enter this particular class because this person's not going to be in it. So I might be able to finish higher than, <laughs> Yeah. you know, and, you know, I laugh for a while because, and, and I'm sure we've been guilty with it with our shooters too. So I'm not calling anybody out, but you almost have to be a master in writing press releases to make your shooter look like they finished the best at that match. <laughs> sure. You know, yeah. you know, it might be that they were in a, you know, this category that was down here, down here, but then the way you write it, you can make it seem like they finished near the top. And then you look at, you know, because it's so hard to like for the average person to go on practice score and try to dissect. Yeah. Yeah. And those scores. Welcome to marketing. I mean, absolutely. Yes. You know, and I'm, I'm absolutely guilty of that. Like we, we, we are storytelling. Um, to uh with a goal of getting some brand exposure right and that's that is fair game while at the same point um you know i think all of it's important right so like we have to grow our brands we have to like we have to grow brand awareness and sales those are my goals as a business owner brand awareness and sales gotta grow um and sales only grow through relationship building right it doesn't grow through a quick one and then you disappear and so like that's how i run my businesses and so absolutely that's certainly a critical component but i think if we realize that we can grow our brand awareness with that and by also being as relatable as possible to the average new guy that shows up on the range i think that's a component that together gets us further than either one alone i I would completely agree with you so shifting gears a little bit I know you've, I've seen this on your website and I've seen different posts that you've done. You're a big proponent of using like long range rim fire. And when I say long range rim fire, I'm, I say it relatively speaking. So I don't get yelled at by the true long range guys, (laughs) 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 but like we've been promoting and talking a lot with different shooters and different things about how valuable shooting longer distances with rim fire can translate over to their, you know, true long range matches, everything from, you know, their technique, their skills, you know, and then doing it all at a cost, at a fraction of the cost of what it costs to shoot their long range stuff. How have you found that helped you? Yeah, it helped me a ton, especially at my last property. So we talk about access uh, and where do we get to go train and what are our limitations with our training facilities? And most folks, I mean, in three gun, I'm expected if I go to a major match to understand all things about shooting up to 600 yards or so with my standard AR-15 rifle. Well, okay, until about three years ago, I didn't have a place to shoot over 130 yards. And so like I could look theoretically at the data uh, on my smartphone, I could confirm once or twice a year with different lots of ammo at different distances and go, okay, the data in my calculator is right or it's wrong. And then I go to a different place, you know, totally different, you know, sea level, uh, like totally different pressure, different humidity. All of a sudden my data is wrong. And so like, I'm going, okay, what can I train at my last property to really improve that? Like, 
minimize the chances that my data is going to be wrong and that I understand uh, enough about the actual like real life shooting application so I can make adjustments. And one of those things was wind. So here in Minnesota, if you want to shoot long distances, uh, you've got to cut like a uh, hallway through the woods, right? Because we've got timber up here, swamps, timber, lakes. Like that's what we have up here. We don't have wide open spaces like they do out West. And so at my last place, I had 130 yards to work with, no way to work on wind until I started implementing a uh, long rifle, 22 long rifle into my training. And on a real windy, gusty day, like you could have to hold a few mils off target in order to get a hit with, with your rimfire loads. And the other part that I really like about it is so I can learn wind. I could, maybe it's a little different than with uh, 223 or 65 Cree or whatever else I'm shooting at distances, but the concepts are the same. I can read wind by looking at what I can see out there uh, off Mirage, off a lot of different things and make a judgment call. So it added a little bit to my skill level by doing it. And then the dwell time in the barrel is so long compared to uh, 223s, like supercharged caliber compared to rimfire, yeah. you know? And so the dwell time in your barrel is so long, your follow through has to be perfect when you're shooting rimfire at distance. And so as I developed more and more skill, this was like magic to me. And it, I realized what was going on later wasn't planned, but I became really, really good at shooting rimfire distances on like one and two inches targets at 130 with wind and stuff at my house. And all of a sudden I could just crush on stuff that uh, normally would be a major challenge on my 223 and realized it was just my follow through was exceptional, right? Because the dwell time was so long on those 22s. It's so short on the 223, I could get away with so much on those guns after rimfire. And that's something I've never heard anybody else say and never thought of myself is just that component of it. How, you know, if you don't follow through with a rimfire, you're going to pay for it at the target. Absolutely. Yeah, it's sitting in that barrel. And a I, long I never time. heard anybody else say that or <laughs> figure that out. That's, you know, that's another great, great component of it. And it's, you know, like you said, too, a lot of people can find 130 yards to go shoot. Yeah. It's a lot tougher to go find six, eight, a uh, hundred yards or a thousand yards to go practice. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. And then even beyond that, just almost in the same way that dry fire helps me with my pistol skills, things like that, or general carbine manipulations, shotgun manipulations, whatever. Uh, rim fire is like the next step in the direction of the center fire that I'm training for because I'm still building all those great positions. I'm still working on my breathing control. Uh, great trigger press is required. Now super solid follow throughs required. And so the skills I develop in, in rim fire shooting, and that's could be rifle. It could be my pistol work too, because I do a lot of single shot position entry and exit drills with rimfire pistol as well. I, I don't work on recoil control because I don't feel like that's adding anything to my nine millimeter, but like single shots and position entry as I'm coming in first shot on target, like all of those things, it's like a cheat code that saves me a bunch of money um, by being able to uh, use those tools. It's great. And how valuable do you think it is like when you're working with new shooters or doing some instruction with them, like starting them on a rim fire where they can, if, if they've never shot before in their life, possibly it gives them a chance to, you know, eliminate some of that fear of fire that they may have, or some of those trepidations they may have of firing a firearm, yep. you know, with a rim fire, because it, like you said, it's not great for recoil management, but in this case, there's not a lot of recoil, so it makes it easier for them. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Everybody I start shooting starts suppressed on rim fire, and they don't have recoil. They don't have noise. Uh, all they have to worry about is sight picture and pulling that trigger straight back and safety. Right? Those are the three things we're worried about when we're starting to shoot. And my kids are studs. Like my daughter shot her first deer this year. She's ten, two hundred forty-eight yards. Not an issue. She'd never fired a gun that big, but like she had no perception that it was going to recoil harder because she shoots rimfire all the time. So when she got done, she was pretty surprised, but she ha <laughs> she hammered that. I mean, that wasn't the plan. That's awesome. But she hammered that deer and because uh, she's got all the trigger press, breathing control, you know, all of those things locked in from being a total rock star on uh, rimfire. 
And one thing you mentioned is you teach them you're in fire shooting suppressed a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that a lot of people overlook is it allows you to have normal conversations with who's ever trying to learn. You know, you don't have to worry about ear pro. Yep. You know, it's a much more casual or easier conversation back and forth as you're training somebody. Yep. Totally you know, different. And- totally different. Totally relaxed. Yeah. It's just it, like you say, casual. I, 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 any new shooters I work on either individually or like if there's a couple of people together, that's cool. But like there's one shooter on the line. We're just having fun, being safe. Yeah. No, no earmuffs that aren't fit well for you because you didn't buy them because you're not a shooter. And now they're crushing your head, bugging you like none of that stuff. It's great. So with your sales and marketing background that you have, I always laugh a little bit because I think sometimes our industry or community is behind the times when it comes to certain marketing practices. Yeah. (laughs) What's your take on that? And what as a, you know, I think we've gotten better over the last few years. For sure. No question. You know, I think there's definitely improvement, but I definitely think there's a long way to go to, um, what do you see like that's one thing that still drives you crazy the way the gun community or the gun industry is marketed? Yeah, well, you know, I think we we have an opportunity and this is something that we incorporate. Anything that you see that would be ours is increased includes lifestyle. You know, like a lot of a lot of stuff. And what I mean by that is people having fun, like people around the sport, like all we see is stage runs from competition shooters, right? Like, okay, that's cool if I'm a competition shooter and I understand what you're doing, but the rest of the world's like, I see your back and you're shooting at targets, but I can't tell if you hit them, you know? And so like to mix in like people loading ammo, hanging out at the table behind the stage, like smiles after you get done, knuckles, like just little stuff. Again, you talk about people being approachable. It's like, that's an approachable community because people are like, oh man, these are just normal dudes. They're enjoying themselves. They're having fun on the range. That looks like something I want to be a part of. And so you're right. There's, it's way better the last few years. Um, I think it will increase, it will continue to get better. I think a lot of marketing leadership at brands in our space uh, is up with the times, understands how to reach the consumer is doing a much better job. But yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Five years ago. But if you just looked at the space, you'd be like, well, uh, you know, like it's a miracle. They sell things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, you'd flip through a gun magazine or walk through shot show and everybody's walls, everything looked the exact same, the exact same. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I say exact same people, not the same person, but yep. just like, like the stereotypical tactical was everywhere. No matter you know, we felt guilty of it and we build rim fires. What are we doing with tactical look <laughs> on our booth, uh, you know, yeah. selling 22s that are not used for that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You got to understand uh, the, the, you know, your ideal consumer, your target market, and you've got to market to those individuals. And we all have different brands with an ideal consumer and the better we can reach those individuals and show them that, uh, like, you know, you got to have that, you got to have that lifestyle stuff mixed in where it's like, this is something you can have fun doing with the people you already hang out with. Like that. And I, and I think that's huge is that fun factor. Cause for a lot of us, that's why we got into it in the first place. It is for me. I mean, once I, once I got that, that initial skill developed where I felt like, uh, I, you know, I was capable now with a handgun, it became something I just fell in love with too. Right. Like it's just the people, the community, you know, it's a place I want to go. Uh, you know, you know, even when I'm old and I'm not competitive, uh, I will still be shooting matches because they're good people. Well, and uh, that's a great point. You bring that up. Like if somebody goes to a match, you know, all you ever see from marketing videos are it's getting better. But a lot of times is like you said, the shot from the back or watching them run a stage where if you actually attend an event, you realize the real magic of those events is all the downtime yeah. behind the firing line where people are talking, getting to know people, you know, and they, they become friends where they may only see each other once or twice a year, but like, especially I know in our rim fire space families, they go out to eat together. They will, yep. you know, it really is a community. And I think we can do a much better job of showing that aspect. 
Yeah. And it's, it, it is what people want to see if they, before they engage, you know, cause you know, activity, at, I mean, I shoot for maybe six minutes in a three day match. I'm there for three days. I don't days. think people understand that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the rest of the time you're either, you either love the rest of it or you're not going right. I mean, well, if you shot slower, like I did, you just shoot like 10 or 12 <laughs> minutes, but <laughs> see, you're just doing it all wrong. Uh, okay. Okay. You're getting double the value. See, <laughs> So last question for you is I'm big on like mindset, learning from mentors, whether it be books, whatever. Is there one quote or book or mentor that has given you a piece of advice that is you've really, that really sticks with you over time? Uh, well, so, uh, there've been a bunch over the years. I would say maybe the, the one that I still bring myself to when, things aren't quite going my way is like Jocko's good. Like he's got this, this whole strategy. It's like, life's not going your way. Good. Like get better. Right. Like he's got this yes. like three minute YouTube that, uh, it was done just, just right to like totally pull me out of any funk. Cause I'm like, man, you know what? This isn't going right, but it's my opportunity to improve. It's my opportunity to work on this other thing. It's my, you know, like I, I think, uh, that for me does it. I share it like once a year on social because it just helps. You know what's funny? The the first time I watched that, yeah, my my first thought was, well, that's dumb. That doesn't solve anything. And then I went back and watched it again, and I'm like, no, it it seemed too easy the first time I listened to it, <laughs> and that's why I didn't think it was, you know, yeah, it was almost too simple and effective for me to wrap my head around. But that is that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's so true. You know, like we're in control of what we do. I mean, that's, that's what we're in control of. Our employees, we're not in control of, like we can guide them. Uh, our families, we're not in control of, like whether people buy or like our stuff, like, like all of those things we don't control. We control what we do. Right. And so when those things around us that we don't control are negatively, like they're not going the way we hope, it is an opportunity to adjust. And, and so that is, again, it hits your pride. Cause it's like, ah, like I'm, this is, you know, this is me. Like I already gave you all I had. It's like, you know, it, you take it as a hit maybe personally, but you can't. And, and so it's stuff like that where it's like, man, you know what? Like I can't be emotionally attached to what I do, I, you know, to the point where I can't accept if it's not received well, or if, you know, if it doesn't grow the way I wanted it to, like, instead of being hurt by that, which is everyone's first response, it's, I need to grow. And I don't know what that means, but maybe this is the opportunity for me to take it to the next level by understanding the problem, developing a new solution and moving forward. And, um, so yeah, I like that. It comes yeah. when, it, like, when it's you know, like you said earlier, you know, life is short. You can't spend it trying to control how other people see you or view you, you know, and try to, you know, like you said, it's easy to be offended or be like, Oh, I want that person. I wish that person would have thought differently of me, but ultimately we don't get to make that decision. Right. No, we don't. <laughs> So where can people, where's the best place people can find you and follow what you have going on? Yeah. Uh, you know, so Instagram, Josh underscore Freilich, uh, Facebook, Josh Freilich. I've got, you know, Freilich firearms website, uh, where we, uh, that's where we host, uh, you know, basically I've got three businesses. So we got Freilich firearms, which is my consulting R and D, brands brand alignment business like that's that is uh, the core of what i've always had and there's you know freilich firearms is dot uh, com is our website for that and then we've got f5 productions which is um f5 productions.com which is my media company and we do a bunch of stuff for my brands my partner brands and then lots of other folks in the outdoor industry it's grown beyond shooting but in the outdoor industry we do a lot of work and then uh we've got our F5 range business. And so, um, that is, we've got what, you know, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff for that too. And we host public events out here that are like training events where I'll bring in other instructors to instruct alongside me. And then we bring people in from all over the place, host them here at our guest lodge, stuff like that. And so, um, 
you know, any of those places or places you will find me uh, and we can communicate. Well, and I think it's important for people to understand or, you know, reach out to you for like the, the brand and marketing stuff that you do, because we are in an industry that can be hard to market. Yeah. We're limited. You know, we, we can't always follow the advice of the so-called experts online because what works for a lot of companies, we are not allowed to do. Correct. Yep. But I think people can learn from the way that you have done it. You know, everything from the way you, you promote your content, content, the way you promote your companies that you work with. You know, I think there's a lot that, like you said earlier, it is a two way street when you're trying to work with a company and it only works if both parties are rewarded. Yep. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's only fun if both companies are rewarded because yes. then everybody's like, man, you know, every meeting's like, hey, what's up? You know, they're, they're your buddies. At a certain point, like all of your partnerships become the most fun because everybody's like, man, like, I don't want that to go away. Like, this is one of my favorites, you know, like that's what I have want. a rule. If I can't, if I have to go to dinner with somebody and I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Why are, why are we trying to work together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> super fair. Super fair. I mean, yeah, yeah I, yeah, uh, I'm known for being, uh, a little harsh, uh, it, when needed, uh, you know, my question to myself is like, this isn't fun. I don't do things that aren't fun. Why am I doing this? Right. Like, like if it gets to that point, I either hire someone to take on that responsibility, right? Because that's a task that I'm not having fun doing. I know it needs to be done. Like I will bring in a resource that can specialize in that, that does enjoy it more than I do. Or I just move on and I go to do something different. Um, and if it's not an extreme value piece of whatever I'm working on, I, I just won't work on it anymore because I, you know, I have to enjoy what I do. I just have to. And, you know, you said it might be harsh, but I would rather have as a company, I would rather have that. Yeah. Than be strung along by somebody whose heart isn't in it. Yep. Yeah. And they're doing it because they get a, they're getting a paycheck or, you know, a check in the, whatever it might be. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'd rather have them be a hundred percent fully vested into what we're doing. And then it seems to work out best for both sides. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Well, Josh, this has been great. Thank you again for taking the time. I know you're busy, obviously by what you just mentioned, they're running three different businesses. So I appreciate it. And thank you. And always thank you for listening. And if you ever have any questions or suggestions, hit us up at podcast at volcorton.com.